afternoon. My name is Louise Kennedy, and I am a business and technology attorney here in Greater Boston. Uh, it's my second time speaking at WordCamp, and I'm always very impressed when late in the day, on a weekend, we have people turn out to talk about copyright and contracts. Because um, I know that not everyone feels that this is maybe their most favorite part of their business. Um, and so I thought what I would do today is a couple of things. Um, the first is uh, acknowledge that the target audience for this presentation is business owners, freelancers, business owners, people who are creating, buying, selling things that are subject to copyright law. That's, that's if, if, so you can all nod in agreement that you are in fact here because that is who you are. You are an entrepreneur, you are a freelancer, you are a business owner, and this is something that's of interest to you. All right, great. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you sort of copyright 101 because I found as I've presented on copyright in the past that there's a ton of misconceptions about what copyright is, how it applies to the work that we that we create and sell, and also how it impacts the overall value of your business um, as a business owner. So I think we're going to start with that. And what I have in this handout, the one old school with the handout, um, so you actually have something physical that you can take with you, and if you have questions, you can refresh your memory. They're in the back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should be more specific. Okay. Matt in the red shirt has some. Um, and what I've done on the front page of the handout is I've given you sort of the um, first year law student half hour description of contract law that you might get. And it's very basic. There are a lot of very, very significant nuances to it. But for the purposes of being a business owner like I am, this is about what you need to know. What is copyright? Copyright is the protection that you get as a matter of law, as someone who creates literary works or other creative works and actually puts them into a fixed medium. So if you have a great idea, that does not count for copyright protection. You need to take your idea, your creative juices, your creative impulses, and actually put them down onto paper, onto your computer, into code, onto the canvas, onto the phono recording, onto the piece, piece of paper, however you choose to record your creative output. For many people here, it's going to be content. You know, I saw a lot of, in the last session that was in this room, there were bloggers. So when bloggers create con content, that is subject to copyright. I know there's developers here. When you write code, when you sit down and of your own mind, without copying from anyone else, write code that is also subject to copyright. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that who owns the copyright in what is created. <coughs> As a general matter, the owner of the copyright is the author. That is the default. As the author of that copyrighted work, you own it. And that ownership gives you certain exclusive rights. So these exclusive rights include the things that you would expect, like the ability to publish it, to post it online, to um, display it for the world to see. But it also includes things like creating derivative works. And a derivative work is basically um, a work that's based substantially on the original copyrighted work. So say, for example, um, I had a, um, it happens a lot in the, in the, in the, um, in the software world. It happens a lot also in the literary and arts where you create something and someone is really inspired by it and then takes it and just changes it a little bit and doesn't really add much of their own creativity to it. That would be considered a derivative work. So as the owner of the copyright, you have the exclusive right to do all of these things. No one else can do these things with your copyrighted work unless you have given them permission to do so. So this all seems very straightforward. Um, if it were the case, we'd have a lot fewer disputes or reasons to be here today. Of course, there's a few um, important nuances that as a business owner, it's important to understand. The first is, as a business owner, 
if you hire people to do work for you, you want to own that work. That seems pretty straightforward. The question is, how do you make that happen? And there's a couple different ways. One is you can have that person be an employee. Under the copyright law, if an employee creates a copyrighted work for you, the business owner, the business owns that copyrighted work. So what does employee mean? A lot of people throw that word around to mean all sorts of things. And for simplicity, what I would recommend you think of employee as being is someone to whom you issue a W-2. We're talking real, formal, you've got workers' comp and unemployment employee. A lot of the folks who are here today, a lot of small businesses don't have formal employees. They have other folks doing work for them and creating copyrighted works. How do you make sure that your business owns those things? And that's where we get to the concept of work for hire. And that's really a term of art um, in the legal world. It's pretty specific as to how you would create something as a work for hire. And basically it means that the work needs to be specifically pre prepared at your request. So you need to commission that work. You need to say, independent contractor, please create X for me. Please write this blog post. Please write this piece of code. Please do these things for me. But that's not enough. You have to have a signed writing. There has to be a contract. If there is no contract, and you're relying on work for hire as the way your business is gonna own that third party's materials, you are going to be out of luck. Because that third party, they own it. You don't, your business does not own it. So this is where we first come into sort of the intersection of copyright and contracts, which is what we're talking about during this session. And I think it's important for everyone to realize that the concept of a work for hire contract does not need to be this massive undertaking. It requires some simple provisions that can be put in place easily, inexpensively, but then you will know that the stuff that your independent contractor, you're the person who's doing a work for hire for you, actually is owned by your business. Um, we have seen a number of cases where this has not been the case. Uh, I'm gonna give you, this is opportunity for war story number one. So when I, I worked for many years as an in-house attorney at IBM, and one of the things that we were doing at IBM while I was there was we were acquiring other companies. And we were just getting into the online collaboration space, and we needed to buy a bunch of small companies. So we would go out and we'd visit a small company in some nondescript office park somewhere, and the 60 IBMers would descend upon the poor six-person company and look at every piece of paper that they had pretty much ever put together in connection with their business. Now this is a great opportunity for these companies because they stood to make a boatload of money as well as have sort of an ongoing relationship with this large company and they were going to get pretty rich. So we walked in, there were seven different companies and of those seven, one of them we went to, uh, we were looking at the technology, it was really cool, really interesting, we are looking at sort of the central part of that technology saying, wow, this is great, let's look at the code, who wrote this part of the code? Oh yeah, that was my partner Jim's next door neighbor's nephew. <clears throat> well, who is this nephew, what was his name? Oh, oh yeah, what was his name, what was his name? Come to find out, they didn't know his name. They didn't know his last name. They didn't know where he was. They tried to track him down. They had never gotten assigned writing from this neighbor kid. And accordingly, they didn't own the central and most important part of the code. The moral of that story is that company did not get acquired. That company missed their opportunity to have that big payout. Now, I'm certain that most of you here are not looking to get acquired by IBM but you are probably looking to have there be something that is of value at the end of the day. You're not doing this as a hobby. You're not doing it just to like bide your time until you retire. You're doing it because you want to create something of value that you can either sell or pass on or otherwise profit from. So getting these types of provisions right can be the difference between having that opportunity for an exit and not having that opportunity for an exit. So work for hire, really important concept. Every important piece of copyrighted material that you have in your business, 
You need to know for sure it was created by a W-2 employee or you have an agreement in place with the person who created it that meets the requirements of the statute. Now, a lot of times people ask me about fair use. Um, and we're going to talk some more about that later in, the, in, the, in the, this presentation. Um, because you want to know, can I use this cool copyrighted thing that I've seen online? This is great. I want to use this. It's, a, it's a publicly available. I must be able to use it. And there's this misperception out there that there is some idea of fair use of stuff that exists out in the general public. And I'd like to go right up front and completely disabuse people of this idea because a lot of people have it just sort of nagging in the back of their minds that, oh, none of this really applies to me because the stuff that I'm doing is fair use. What I've done for you on the handout is I have basically given you the legal definition of fair use. And 99 times out of 100, businesses do not meet the requirements of this statute. You have to have it be for the purposes of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. Now, you can maybe twist those words and say, well, I'm really just commenting on this. I'm really just, in reality, if you are in business to make money, you are most likely not going to be able to take advantage of this fair use, um, this fair use requirement. Because one of the things that you want to look at is, number one, the purpose of the use. Is it commercial in nature? If it's commercial in nature, then that always mitigates against any sort of fair use. And commercial in nature means you have advertisers, you have, you are getting compensated by a client or, an, or another company. Um, so that, that's one com important consideration. And the other is the effect of the potential market on the original work. If you really should have taken a license, you probably should have paid a license fee to the person who created that thing. You need to look at whether or not this is something that someone would expect to be compensated for. So this is a little bit of a side note, but I find that whenever I give a presentation of this type, I get at least three questions saying, but what I'm doing is fair use, and it requires some serious looking to see if that really is true. Then the final sort of copyright overview that I wanted to give is the difference between a registered and an unregistered copyright. So as a matter of law, if you are the author, you own the copyright. Whether or not you put the little C with your name, with the year, all rights reserved, which I do recommend that you do, whether or not you do that, you own the copyright. The little statement that you put at the bottom of something like your website is helpful because it puts the world on notice that you are asserting your copyright in that work. But in the event of a dispute, an unregistered copyright does not get you very far. If you have something that you have created that's subject to copyright, that you think has significant value to your business, it is absolutely in your best interest to register the copyright. You can even do it yourself. Library of Congress, Copyright Office website, approximately $35 to register a copyright. It takes anywhere from two weeks to six months for it to issue. And it gives you some real benefits. And what I've done at the bottom of the first page of the handout is tell you about some of those benefits. If you've written the next best piece of code, that this great program, this great um, uh, brochure, ebook, whatever it is that you think is so awesome that people might want to rip it off, it's absolutely in your interest to do this. One of the things is it creates a public record of your copyright claim. No one can ever claim that, well, I, you know, I didn't know that this was subject to copyright. You have actually registered for a copyright, you've paid your $35 and gone through the steps on the website. Um, if you ever want to file an infringement suit against someone for illegally copying it, you cannot go to federal court in the United States without having this federal registration on file. And then third, um, if you file for your copyright within three months after its first publication, or before someone starts to infringe it, you can get significant statutory damages and have your attorney's fees paid for in that case by the infringer. So that alone um, is very, very important. Um, 
Pursuing a copyright case is very, very expensive. Um, we have two cases that are pending in federal court for clients right now. Um, one of both of whom, one is a web developer uh, that is trying to assert their copyright, and the other is a content producer who's trying to assert ownership over his copyright against some very brazen infringers. Um, and so having the registered copyright means that at the end of the day, our fees can be taken care of and not simply come out of the pocket of, of the copyright holder or out of whatever the original eventual settlement or resolution of that case is. So it might not seem like a big, a big deal right now, but if there's something that's that important to you that if someone was stealing it, you would need to stop them, very important consideration. All right, so that was about 15 minutes copyright tutorial the basics of what you need to know about the U.S. copyright law. Um, one other question that I get sometimes is, is it worthwhile um, to mark my, my materials as subject to copyright even if I don't file? And the answer to that is yes. Um, you definitely want to have in the footer of your website, in the footer of your brochure, on any publication that you put out, the C with the circle around it, and the year, and the name of your business. So I see a lot of times, my, my URL for my website is westhillcouncil.com. So I would see a lot of people saying, copyright 2015, westhillcouncil.com. Well, guess what? Your website can't own a copyright. You can own a copyright. Your company can own a copyright. If you operate as a DBA, it would be your name, DBA, your company name, because you as an individual own that copyright. You just do business as that entity. So it might seem like you know, sort of <coughs> splitting hairs a bit, but I see it all the time. And web developers tend to just stick that in for their clients, and it's completely wrong. So the copyright owner, the entity that owns the copyrighted work, has their company name or personal name in that state. Yes. Can our company oh, name oh. include? I'm sorry. Can the company name include the .com just on the whim of the creator? She asked whether the company name can include .com as part of the company name. So we advise clients as they um, as they incorporate. We don't really recommend that you include that as part of your company name. Um, first of all, if you want to get trademark protection for that company name, having .com at the end is not helpful. Um, you'll find even big, large national brands that are known as something.com, that is not their company name. Um, there's a whole host of reasons for that. Um, it should be the actual entity that is owning the copyright. Obviously, if you do business as, you know, uh, susanswebsite.com, Yep, then it would be Susan, last name, DBA, susanswebsite.com, and that would be fine. All right, so now we're going to turn the piece of paper over, because I really want to make sure that we all understand, as business owners, how we can protect ourselves, how we can protect our business, protect our investment in our business, and hopefully reap the benefits of all of our hard work upon exit. So I've divided this into three categories. Thinking about who you hire, what you use, and what you sell. Because copyright plays into all three of these. So in terms of hiring, you need to ask yourself, and maybe this is the time when you start to scribble in the margins here. Who are the people that you use to create copyrighted works for your business? Are there W-2 employees? Are there independent contractors? What are their names? Who are they? Am I protecting myself? Am I protecting my business as they create these things for me? The third category, and one that is often overlooked, is co-founders or investors. Or, I don't have money yet to pay this guy, so he's not really an independent contractor or a W-2. I've just promised him equity. You need an agreement with that guy in order for you to own what it is that he is providing to you. Now, you might think, well, he's my best friend since I was five years old, he's my next door neighbor, he's my brother-in-law. None of this matters. In fact, all of those things make it even more important 
that you have a piece of paper in place. Many of the disputes that we see and many of the difficult situations that we deal with are exactly that. Uh, we just recently had a client where the co-founders have been best friends since they were seven. They were so motivated to start this business. They were so excited. They had great traction. They had some celebrities who thought their business was a great idea because it had sort of a nonprofit component to it. Things were going great until they weren't. And now that business has one owner, not two, because they split and went separate ways. And his creative input into that business needs to be owned by that business. So we were lucky we were able to come in and make sure that when he assigned his membership interest in that LLC to his partner, that we included all the IP ownership terms in that document. That formal, official, I am no longer a member of this LLC, and by the way, all this great copyrighted stuff I created while we were working together and still best friends is still owned by the company. And it's unfortunate. I mean, they, they unfortunately, they're not even speaking to each other at this point. Um, and that tends to be how it goes. And we hate to get involved at that stage. We'd much rather get involved at the beginning when the co-founders can sit down and say, we need to both agree that everything we create is owned by this business right now. Right now. Not when we're having a falling out later. So the question that you ask yourself under this hiring category is, what agreements do I need to have in place with these people? So we've gone through this. So you have your W-2 employees. By matter of law, the stuff they create for you is yours. I also like to sort of add an additional little confidentiality and IP ownership agreement with those folks. I find that it sort of focuses them when, if they are to leave, that even after they leave, they don't have any rights to these things. It, um, if, they have, if you have to fire them, you can remind them of their obligations under that agreement. It can be helpful. It's not mandatory, but it can be helpful. With respect to independent contractors, we've talked about that. Um, there are many, many different forms of these agreements. And it's always very, very tempting to go online and be like, I need an independent contractor agreement so that I can have this person create some blog posts for me, or whatever the thing is. And so one of the things I've added on this handout that I think will be of interest to you is the second reference in the footnote on the bottom. And it's a Columbia Law School website. Now you would think a Columbia Law School website would be like the boringest, least interesting thing you could possibly pull up on your computer. They're known for sending like 50% of their graduates to Wall Street. This can possibly be interesting. This website is awesome. It gives you clauses from dozens of agreements that all purport to do the same thing. They all purport, for example, to give someone an exclusive license to use something that they've created. And there's great ones for the creator of the content, and there's great ones for the acquirer of the content, and there's everything in between. If you go online to look for one of these agreements, how do you know which one of these you're getting? Are you getting the one that benefits you, or are you getting the one that benefits the guy who's working for you and whom you're paying? So the important piece here is to have eyes wide open that it is absolutely worthwhile to have someone just take a quick look at whatever it is you're thinking of putting in place. If this is important IP to you, this is important intellectual property, it's worth the .2 hours to have someone who understands this area just give it the quick once over, make recommendations, or even put up, if you're gonna do this a lot, put a template in place that you can use every single time you wanna hire somebody to do this kind of work. Super easy. All right, the next category is use. And this is an area where people um, always pepper me with many, many, many questions. What are those third party copyrighted works that you incorporate into your stuff? Whether you're a developer and you're using open source or commercially licensed code, whether you're a, a blogger and you find this really cool thing online that is a graph that demonstrates exactly what you wanted to be talking about, whatever that thing is, can you, should you use it, incorporate it into your product, your service, or your marketing materials? And when you're looking at this, there's a couple things to be thinking about. Um, 
how can I protect my business from this copyright owner coming back and telling me that I'm infringing? Because it happens. Um, and it happens in a lot of different contexts. I'll give two examples. One is a developer example for the developers in the audience. I, I know a bit about open source, did a lot of open source work at IBM, and if you ever have used any uh, code in your work that's subject to the Apache license, the MIT license, the BSD license, those are all great because they give you lots of flexibility on how you can use the code in your products, how you can commercialize it without having open source terms attached automatically. Fantastic. One thing that it does require, though, is that you include in your code a notices.txt file that includes the copyright statements and reproduction of that license in your product. So as nice as it is to get this free stuff online that you have a lot of flexibility to use, you need to make sure that you're doing that right. Because when the time comes for someone to run a code scan on that code, and they determine that you actually have used Apache or MIT-based licensed materials in your code and have not included the proper attributions, you're opening yourself up to a significant copyright infringement claim or just to the statement that your code isn't really worth what you think it is because you have not sort of taken care of business and, and handled the copyright components properly. And with large companies, like very large companies, they're very concerned about this because over time, if they have a number of these different requirements that are not being sort of followed through on, then they have significant risk. So if that's something that's of concern to you, making sure that you're sort of dotting your I's and crossing your T's with respect to open source is very important. Do you want to come up to this uh, microphone? Because they've asked that we try to get all of the uh, questions. Just um, a quick comment. Have you yes. seen the show Silicon Valley? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. With the infringements of code. Yes, no, it's, it, it's important. And so the other thing, you know, obviously I could do a whole session on GPL and LGPL and all the different kinds of open source codes there are and which, which are good to use based on where you want to end up with your business. That's not what this is about. But in terms of basic copyright attribution and following the terms of copyright licenses, this is very, very important. There's also commercial software out there that you might have a valid developer license to that also requires you to include notices in your code. So that's another important consideration. Then we have the whole idea of clip, clip art and stock photos. Um, this is, anybody who works in this area knows that this has become a really contentious area. Um, if you go onto a website that even makes you pay for stock photos or clip art, um, often they are not standing behind that. They don't offer you any protection, they sell it to you as is, no warranties, no indemnities. If you get sued, you are completely on your own. It is absolutely worth knowing which of these companies actually will stand behind you. I'll give you one example, and I'm not plugging for this company, it's just one I've happened to have reviewed recently. The iStock photo page, they offer you a $5,000 indemnity if you're sued for copyright infringement based on your proper use within the license use of their materials. Unfortunately, $5,000 might not even get you in the door of the law firm to defend you against that suit. So you pay the extra 13 bucks and it bumps up to something like $50,000. So something to keep in mind, understand where these materials are coming from, understand the license. If you can't understand it, find someone who can help you work through it and be consistent in the way that you use these materials. And then finally, the last category is sell. You have something subject to copyright that you sell to others, whether through a service, whether as a product, whether for free, with advertising or whatever else. What items that you create, that you provide to customers are subject to copyright, how do you provide those individuals with the rights they need to actually use those materials. What rights do they need? What rights don't they need? If you give away exclusive rights in and to everything you create for every customer, then you have to start from scratch every single time you work on a new project. So having the freedom of action to know that you can start and continue to get smarter and better and build on what you've done with each new client is a great reason to have a very, very 
well-drafted copyright provision in any services deliverable uh, you know, agreement scenario. Um, and then finally, how to use copyright claims to help protect against non-payment by clients. And this is like the oldest trick in the book, and it's very, very simple. You grant them a license to the stuff that you're providing. For example, a software license, a content license, whatever it is, and that license is subject to their payment. If they do not pay, the license goes away. They are infringing. If you have already filed for a copyright on that thing, you can bring them to court and they will have to pay your attorney's fees for infringing your copyright. So, a few things to keep in mind. Three different areas where you need to have contracts. The hiring of people, the using of third-party content, and the selling of your own content. And I have a sense that there's a number of questions, so I'm going to open it up to questions now. Can you step up to the microphone? Uh, so I have a few questions. The first one is um, kind of things like Google Maps and you know other web services that you can actually take and put in print. I get a lot of requests to do things like that, and I just feel a little. Eh. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, there's two things you need to look at. There's the Google Maps Terms of Service, which will tell you whether or not that's permitted. My um, strong suspicion is that it is not. Um, and then there's also, if you're a developer who's incorporating Google Maps into another third, into your own application for a client, the Google Maps API has its own terms that are very specific about how you can incorporate a Google Maps widget or whatever into whatever it is that you're creating, whether it's a website or a, or, um, a, a, a web service. And then if I can ask a second yeah. one, which might be uh, too much info, is that? What, what, do you, what do you consider fair pricing, like per hour or for certain types of contract if you're hiring someone? So that's a great question. Um, I, I gave a, a speech last year to a, a large group of business owners, and we talked a little bit about how do you hire a lawyer. And I think the less important thing is how much they charge per hour, and the more important thing is do they know anything about what you do. Um, I will tell you right now what I don't do. I cannot write your will. I cannot close your real estate transaction. I cannot get you a divorce, I cannot get you out of jail. I can't do any of those things. If you're going to a lawyer who can do any of those things, they're not the right lawyer for this project. Um, you need a business lawyer. Um, if you have a very heavily intellectual property business, you need an intellectual property lawyer. That said, you don't need to spend $800 with a big law firm in Boston. There are plenty of resources that cost significantly less than that, and many of them will offer you a flat price. So say, for example, a client comes to me and says, I need a template subcontractor agreement. I sit down with them, no charge, learn about their business, give them a flat fee. This is what it's gonna cost. The, I recommend the first couple times you use it, that you just run it by me to make sure you filled in the blanks properly to make sure you're getting the value out of, out of the project. You usually don't even charge for that. So, but I know you're looking for a more concrete answer than that. Um, for a small business, I think you're looking in the ballpark of $250 to $300 an hour. But you shouldn't necessarily pay by the hour. You should understand what you're asking for, understanding what you're going to get, and what kind of value you're going to get from that, and see if it makes, obviously it needs to make sense for you. As a sole proprietor, what is the best way to have a DBA? Like, what, is there some sort of procedure yep. to that? Or? There absolutely is. Okay. So in order to be a legal DBA, um, you need to go to your city town hall and you need to walk up to the clerk and say you need the DBA form. Uh, you will fill it out. They will charge you about, depending on what town you live in, Cambridge is a little bit more, about $15. Yeah. You have to renew it every seven, six, seven years. And that puts the world on notice that you as an individual are doing business under this business name. If you have not done that and you get sued, you can have some difficulties. Um, the only thing I would warn you about is that if you work out of your home and the nature of your business is something that might cause your town concern about the zoning of your home, you just want to take that into consideration as you're doing it. Most cities don't have any issue with a WordPress developer working out of their home. If you walk in to get your DBA certificate, they will not care. But if you'd say that you're going to have you know, you know, 30 clients coming in and out of your house every day, then that's usually when they start to have an issue. If I can add to that, I've actually had capital gains um, 
charged to me because I filed the DBA. So some towns you can be a little careful and yeah, but I deeper. yeah, it's true. She indicated that sometimes you, there can be fees associated with filing the DBA. For example, that I my office is in Beverly, Massachusetts. You can be subject to some personal property taxes. Um, I have 4,000 square feet and, and eight people, and mine come out to about $17 a quarter. So it typically is not super expensive, and the benefits of doing it legally and doing it the right way generally significantly outweigh any of the costs. So some of us work with clients on a one-off basis, others on a recurring basis. So in terms of terms of services on the website, is there a way that you would break those out? Do you separate those? Or are there primary differences with terms Yeah. those two separate types of clients? No, that's a great question. So first of all, unless you're signing people up online, I don't recommend using terms of service on a website to contract with your customers. If you have a truly web-based system where people come to your website saying that's the only way they can get to your services and they put in the information, you've got a terms of service, a privacy policy, and it's all there, then that's fine. But if you have clients you're doing projects for, I recommend you have a separate services agreement. And the way we structure services agreements is with an attached statement of work or project assignment or whatever you want to call it, so that if there's one project, it's just that. But if you do multiple projects, all you have to do is the legal terms are done. You just have a little attachment that gets attached to it describing the new project. So it becomes very simple and, and streamlined. For those of us who are short, um, <laughs> for those of us who are bloggers, yes. do you suggest that we copyright each post, or how is a graceful way of handling that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I recommend that you have um, on your uh, the site where you post your blog posts that you have a, a copyright statement there. Um, and you can also have a statement on your blog that talks about permitted uses of your materials. And you can be very clear that this is subject to copyright, all rights reserved. Inquiries regarding use should be directed to this email address or something to put people on notice. They can't just take your stuff, but that there is a mechanism if they do want to use your stuff and then you can figure out a way to license it to them or otherwise make it available to them. Are there books to look this up on? I guess I need to get a lawyer to like remember it all for me. Okay, are there books to look this up on or do you need to get a lawyer to uh, help you with this? Um, I'm sure there are books. The thing is that every business is different. Um, a lot of people, um, I, I was listening to NPR the other day and heard an ad for LegalZoom and I get a lot of questions about whether LegalZoom is a good place to go for this kind of thing. Um, and there's pros and cons, obviously. I come from a little bit of a biased perspective as a small business technology attorney that I kind of think that our services are way better. But I think that there is something to be said about having a group of trusted advisors as a business owner. I know that when I work with a business and most of my colleagues and people in other firms that I respect, when they work with a business, you're not on the clock when they're telling you about what the next thing is that's coming down the pike. And they're able to help you plan for that. So if I have a client that says, oh, I'm launching a new website in six months, I can say, oh, what's the functionality going to be? Oh, you're going to do that? We should really put some terms of use around that. Or we need to change your privacy policy or change this so that people can contribute content. Because when you have individuals contributing content to your site, it triggers a whole other set of IP issues. So I just know what's going on with them. And you don't get that from a book. And you don't get that from a website or, a, or a, one of those types of services. Um, so, yeah, and a lot of it's just from experience. I find that those of us who work with a lot of companies in a particular industry can get things done very quickly and efficiently. To follow up on the gentleman's question about a DBA, yeah. let's say there are two people involved. One person has a DBA through, let's say, a local town here. Yep. You know, person X uh, doing business as business X. Yep. But then another person has filed a U.S. patent and trademark on that name. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the issues regarding that? Because sure. my understanding is the person who owns the patent and trademark, whether they did it on day one or you know, nine years later, 
has full rights to that name and can charge the person with the DBA X amount of dollars a year for using that name on, on their .com or .net. Yep. All right. Yep. So that's trademark. That's a little outside the scope of what we're talking about here, but I'm happy to say a couple of quick words about trademark. Trademark is um, one of those things where it's similar to copyright. There's common law trademark where you can use a trademark without ever filing with the U.S. government, or you can actually file your trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And like copyright, you get a lot more rights and a lot more remedies if you have filed. So in that scenario, let's, let, let's, let's imagine that big bad trademark owner comes after little DBA guy. What happens? He gets a cease and desist letter that says, I use this first, I have a trademark, stop using it. You've got a couple choices then. You can stop using it, you can engage in negotiations with them and pay them some sort of a royalty, or you can say, I was paying for it, I was using it first, and work with an attorney to challenge their trademark. So you do have, there are options. If you have a business name that you love, especially if you're in a sort of a narrow field of business where you can get away with filing in just one trademark class, it's absolutely worth doing to file the U.S. trademark. Um, you know, it's a couple hours of attorney time and maybe less, maybe, maybe an hour, hour and a half, um, and a filing fee, and then it's yours, um, and then you can police it and make sure others don't use it. Uh, yeah, I uh, work with a lot of nonprofits, mm -hmm. and we make, we're starting to make extensive use of Creative Commons material. Yes. And you know, every time I use use one, I see a different interpretation of it. There are several levels of Creative Commons work, mm -hmm. and I start to wonder: Am I angling for trouble here? Are there any common areas you have to watch out when using Creative Commons work? That's well, I think that the main things are to understand the terms of the Creative Commons license that they have attached. My understanding is there's still only one version of that license. Yeah, well, you know, you go onto some of these image sites that do use Creative Commons, and the, it, this is what, it, maybe you're correcting a mis, mis, you know, misunderstanding on my part, but it seems that there are variations on the theme that can be imposed by the content creator. Yeah, yeah, or they could be imposed by that intermediary who's actually selling mm -hmm. and profiting from that Creative Commons material. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just important to know what you're getting and what they've put out there, because that's what you're bound by. So if there's a copy of the Creative Commons license, you read that, you make sure you're comfortable with that and that you're complying with that in any use. But then in addition to that, you also have to look at whatever the crazy thing is that the content owner put up. I've seen examples of developers, for example, who use like a Apache or a BSD license, and then they put their own little thing that makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. It, my legal advice in that situation is don't use that thing. Well, that, that's sort of where I'm going. If I, I, if I don't see it clean, I just let's go find something else. Yes, that is that is great advice. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's it. All right, Thank I think we're so done. Much. Thank you very much. Okay.